Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and is through all and in you all. Won't you say amen? I want to talk for a few moments on the subject, password. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, take up residence in this body, lay siege on my spirit, and lift up Jesus, that we all may be filled with the inferno of his presence. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. And let everyone say amen. I am completely and unabashedly compelled to reiterate the importance of number one. Considering that when I was learning my timetables during my elementary years, I was taught by my mother and father, along with my church school homeroom teacher, that my success in learning my timetables would depend solely on my ability to understand and interpret the importance of one. I can hear mom's contralto voice in cadence with measured and stressed accents empowered by her urgency for excellence saying, son, one times four equals four. And so on. Of course, I wanted to hasten my time to go out and play and hang out with my buddies by taking the easy way out and skipping the tables of ones by jumping to the higher timetables like my fives, my six, seven, eight, and nines. Because if I could establish a distinction in my ability to recite the higher timetable, as a quick learner, I would be seen by the teacher and the class as being special, far ahead of everyone else, perhaps the teacher's favorite student. What I did not know was the fact that the power of one is an indispensable necessity, but not just necessary. You see, what I did not know was the fact that one is an imperative, vital, crucial, and necessary number to progress 
movement, determination, advancement, increase, and expansion. Even heaven rejoices over the repentance of one sinner. One is the only number that is complete within itself. It promises favorable increases. I argue that one or oneness is the only means of being a part of the body of Jesus Christ. It is the password to advancement within the mathematical domain. I see one as the password for access to all universal believers of Jesus Christ or those who want to be a part of the body of believers. The Apostle Paul speaks with clarity that there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us all. I learned in this text that Paul's message to the Ephesians embodies the doctrine of members in the body of Christ and their behavior towards one another. Paul's assertion is not an idle orthodoxy predicated on denominational arrogance of doctrinal superiority. But he does build his theology of oneness on the continuum that was established and created in the prayer of Jesus Christ. When Jesus prayed, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one with us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Paul encores John's reported prayer of oneness by Jesus Christ himself. He projects unknowingly the oneness with future intent, perhaps in a religious philosophical approach of a Jan Spencer who would write about the theology in music, the theology of oneness where one has the ability to describe music without judging it, where one moves from this descriptive theology to a biblical theology and finds an analysis and comparison between what is sung and how it relates to the word of God or moving from normative theology to predictive theology where there is an analysis of how this music will affect the future states of affairs. Paul was on point for this 21st century. This Paul does with theological certainty. He, is audaciously, he audaciously enunciates the influence, the effect, the confluence, the coming together, of fluency through oneness without fear of synchronizing of the oneness in the body of believers. I see Paul as creating a password of oneness that promises increase and expansion. Consider 
that Wikipedia says a password is a word or string of characters used for user authentication to prove identity or access approval to gain access to a resource. The other day I forgot my password. And the computer had no mercy on me. AOL wouldn't even talk to me. I had to call Apple. And Apple allowed me to reset my password. But they also wanted to know what were some of the old passwords I had because there's only one password that's legal in the cloud. My brothers and sisters, the password that has been given the people of God is 1L, 1F, and 1B. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism and that's in the cloud. But what about this body, this body ensemble? Walt Whitman, writing on the substance of feeling, declared that the Civil War was about the body. As Jonah Lear puts it, the crime of the Confederacy, Whitman believed, was treating blacks as nothing but flesh, selling them and buying them like pieces of meat. Whitman's revelation, which he had for the first time at New Orleans slave auction, was that the body and mind are inseparable. To whip a man's body was to whip a man's soul. Whitman's central poetic pronouncement was we do not have a body, we are a body. The body is a community of individual parts intended to be and function in unity. Because we do not have a body, we are a body. We are a body of physical and spiritual material. Physically, we have one heart one pair of lungs, one liver, one pair of eyes embodied in one physical body. Spiritually, we have gifts in the forms of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, all physically and spiritually for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The body ensemble suggests vividly that many entities within the body are committed to each other in role and function that guarantees expansion. As long as the ensemble follows the head of the body, Jesus Christ, by accessing the body through the password, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and not the username, every part will function within the prescribed destiny of God's natural selection. Ladies and gentlemen, the church denominational name is only the username. It is never to take the place of the password, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The denominational name only identifies the particular, particular function of the organization. However, it is the password of one Lord, one faith, and one baptism that guarantees expansion and increase through Jesus Christ our Lord. When the entire body of Christ works together through the direction of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I was in Southern England Conference about a year ago. I was invited to speak there, and 
the 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 um, the tour the, the director of stewardship shared with me that the Seventh Day Adventist Church in the Southern England Conference is involved in a citywide outreach with all of the other denominations in the city. I thought somebody would say amen. I didn't say evangelism. I said outreach. Because in the body of Christ, according to this prayer, Jesus prayed for those who would believe in him. And if they believe in him, they are a part of the body of Christ. So somebody say amen. amen. Oh, no, I'm not preaching against a, a denomin uh, the denomination, but it's one thing we have to establish. We don't get out of here without understanding we are not a body. All of us who believe in Jesus are the body of Christ. Would you say amen? The lingering question, how will the members of this body conduct themselves with each other? Well, there is such a thing called the body loop. The world we live in is round. This roundness suggests to me that it is formed in a circle that is actually circulating. It is the distance around something. In other words, it is looped. Young people today will listen to a piece of music and whatever spot they like, they will take it off and loop it. And they play that loop over and over and over again. And if somebody can preach through the, 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 the art of hip hop, you can say amen, you know what hip hop is then they have product but it is because of the loop they had that they have this continuum continuum of sound with no distraction no rest but it is supported when something is looped it tells us that there is or will be a journey or movement that starts and finishes at the same place. The racetrack is a loop. It's circumferential. The earth is a loop. It's circumferential. The body is a loop. The apple is a loop. The orange is a loop. Potatoes are a loop. God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are a loop. Three distinct parts, one in purpose. When we consume physically or spiritually, we will start, whatever we consume will start and end in the same place. God's physical creation in Genesis and his spiritual creation in John is a parallel journey which promises the presence of of the loop. Our circulatory system is a movement of life that starts and finishes at the same place. Our cardiovascular systems were developed in our mother's womb. But in this dual creation that God has given in physical re creation and spiritual creation, our spiritual lives are developed or were developed at Calvary when Jesus shed his blood for our rebirth. Our digestive system was developed so that we could participate in the process of breaking down our food to be used by the body. But our spiritual digestive system was developed by the apostles so that we could participate in the process of breaking down our spiritual food to be used by the spiritual body. Our nervous system was developed to transmit nerve impulses and anticipation of some important or future event. Our prophets and prophecy 
were developed to transmit spiritual impulses in anticipation of some important future event. Our reproductive system relating to male and female procreation, male and female pastors aid in procreating people in the body of Christ. The aforementioned status of God's physical and spiritual creation in the bodily human context will produce and exceed human imagination, expansion, and increase. If those who believe will remember the password, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. James F. White, no relation to Ellen White, in his book, Introduction to Christian Worship, writes, and I quote, Luther says that in worship, the people assemble to hear and discuss God's word and then praise God with song and with prayer. Thus, worship has a duality, which is revelation and response, both of them empowered by the Holy Spirit. Won't you say amen? Longevity means long life. Long life suggests good genes and genealogy. Good genealogy is promoted by proper nutrition, and in this case, proper nurture. If the password is used for continued accessibility to the body. Question, how does this look? How can this body nurture and nourish it itself? Every member of the body is changed to edify the body by replenishing and sharing and uplifting and advancing the growth of the body as in unity and diversity. How often we as Seventh-day Adventists recite with great denominational pride Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Fear God and give glory to him for his hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. And yet, we forget if every nation, kindred, tongue, and people accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ, then every nation, kindred, tongue, and people has the right to reply to God's global love from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is not going to return until churches get to the place where whatever you bring for the Lord that is driven by the Holy Spirit can be presented in the body of believers. Bite on that a while. We ought to have church in such a way that a drunkard walking off the street can walk in and he may not understand Mozart, Chopin, or Tchaikovsky. But when he can relate to amazing grace, where the cadences of such that his big toe begins to connect to the cadence. And if he doesn't get anything or she out of the sermon, he or she has bought their gift to him because it's about him. Mighty quiet. It's not about denomination. It's not about the conference office. It's not even about the church manual because God and God alone is to be worshiped and to be praised. Won't you say amen? amen? Edification of the body is incomplete without recognition of culture, people's values and beliefs, ethnology, that segment of this globe that people's origins begin.
intercultural communication where cultures connect. When cultures connect and the spirit of God is present, everybody wants to rejoice about Jesus. And in rejoicing, we get a glimpse into the cultural and ethnic fabric of the other person. We may not understand how they do what they do or what they're even singing or playing, but the rallying point is Jesus because he is the creator and we are his creation. The question of how to conjure edification. How do we as Christians with that particular culture or subculture come to understand that a song can say more than a speech or a sermon. The song may become a sermon. There's a reason gospel music sounds different than liturgical hymns. The people that wrote the old gospel hymn were simply worshiping God. They were responding to God. Whenever you respond to God, the spirit of God is there. Paul said when it comes to singing, he would pray. As we said last night, when you, when you live in prayer, when your response is always to God, the other people may not know the name of what you're singing, but they'll join in because of the presence of the Spirit. So whether it's spirituals versus gospel or European classical music versus African-American classical or Africanized classical music or East Indian classical music versus Afro-American classical music or jazz, hello somebody, versus blues. We're going to deal with that this evening. See, God doesn't worry about all these things we worry about. Because the praise is going to him. And can none of us judge it anyway? We don't know what we're talking about. But God accepts it. And I say to you today, when we get to the place where our worship and our praise is directed to him, then we all will be on the same corner, worshiping God and loving our togetherness in returning to him what belongs to him. Can you say amen? The arbiter in all of this is not denominational, democratic, or republican. It is not white or black, but it is the, within the realm and the reality of one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We no longer have to ask God to make us one. We are one. Until we can move from our infatuation and our exaggerated sense of importance and our exaggerated infatuation with our usernames to our God we return the password one L one Lord one F one faith one B one baptism we will not have access to the head of the body, Jesus Christ, until we come together in oneness. Would you say amen? amen. I'm thinking of a story that I heard about a young seminarian who had come home, he had graduated, and he was to deliver 
the morning sermon. This comes from William Augustus Jones. And when he finished preaching, he stood at the door and one of the mothers of Zion came through and he said, well, mother, how was it? And she looked up at him and said, boy, it's like this. I feel like I'm somewhere between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. My brothers and sisters, today I feel like I'm somewhere between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. Because when we are bookended between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy, worship is not just what you do on the seventh day. Worship becomes 24-7. In my old age now, I wake up in the morning and when I sit on the bed and my medulla oblongata contact, connects with my cerebellum and sends a message to my phalanges and I realize that I'm alive, I start patting my feet and I start praising God for keeping me through the night. That's called grace. I praise him on the 24th when I go and I cash my check and I know that after I've returned my tithe, I'm not going to have enough money, but somehow the Lord presses it down and expands it and I've got money carried over from one day, day to the next because of grace, because I'm bookended between thank you Jesus and Lord have mercy. When I walk into the car dealer and I know that my credit is bad, but I sat down and I told the man all I had and he said, well, let's see what we can do. And an hour later, I drive off the parking lot with a brand new car and I know I don't have a dime in my pocket. I realize it is because I'm situated somewhere between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? That's why you got to get the password. Because when you get the password, you stop worrying about people and you think about how, as Paul says, you walk and you ambulate between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. So my question is this. Church has spent a lot of money for this weekend, we have studied, we've sung, we feel it's all right to sway a little bit because really we're in line with God's creation. He told the trees they could sway. They sway in cadence. What's the matter with us? We can't sway. Huh? Where do we go from here? What I'm asking, are we going to continue to be splintered where you can go to one church and all they want to sing is anthems, you go to another church, all they want to do is gospel, you go to another church, they don't want to do nothing. Or are we going to first start individually participating in the experience of worship and praise individually to God about him. And that is not doing it the Baptist way or the Adventist way or the Presbyterian way. It is simply doing it because it all belongs to